We want your questions. We want them on video and we want them now. We are looking for questions. Your questions. Your questions could pertain to anything related to evangelism, apologetics, the Bible, or anything else that might be on your mind. And to our atheist and agnostic friends out there, you are invited to come and play too. You certainly do not have permission to kill in my name. A Muslim, a Hindu, a Mormon, a Catholic, and Fred Phelps. How can I decide which of you has the truth? Why didn't Jesus tell you ahead of time? Say you're sitting around one day, minding your own business, and some entity appears before you and says, I am Yahweh. How can you tell that this entity is you know, telling you the truth? What if Yahweh is insulted by the idea that it wants blind obedience even to the point of murdering children? He drowned every single baby in the world, he burned babies with fire sulfur in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he starved unnumbered babies to death in the desert. How can you have the moral wherewithal to decide whether Yahweh was justified in committing these acts? Ray brings up the design argument saying that buildings don't happen by themselves. This is basic human common sense. But for centuries now, we have been finding more and more cases where common sense doesn't work at all, especially in two areas that have enormous bearing on the existence and behavior of the universe, which are quantum physics and relativity. In Matthew 19, 3-9, Jesus says that divorce was never Yahweh's intention, and further, that Moses' allowance actually gave them permission to sin, given that Jesus here declares it a sin to divorce and remarry, did the Holy Spirit cause a single sperm cell to appear inside Mary's body? Maybe the Holy Spirit caused a half strand of male DNA to spontaneously appear within Mary's recently ripened egg. By what mechanism is Jesus the actual son of Yahweh? Why is it that the Holy Spirit doesn't make these matters clearer to you guys? At what point does a child cross the line between salvation by default and condemnation by default? Creatheism? Given all the disagreement among people who call themselves Christians, why aren't almost all Christians engaged with other Christians trying to come up with a coherent message to the rest of the world? Religious people often claim that atheists are arrogant. How is it not astoundingly arrogant to believe that you, and at most a few million other humans in all of history, have the truth, while all the billions of others are dead wrong? How is it that your basis for morality, which is because Yahweh says so, is somehow more legitimate than my basis for morality, which is simply that being good is the right thing to do. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5, I will be his father and he will be my son. That's quoting from 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 14. But just keep reading for context. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. Now if Yahweh was talking about Jesus in the first sentence, who was it talking about in the second sentence? Isn't your God embarrassed by the things you say? God is love, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and 16. Love keeps no record of wrongs, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Chad brings up various Old Testament prophecies and asserts that their fulfillment is proof that they were inspired by the Supreme Being. Unfortunately, the only claims that these prophecies were fulfilled are to be found in the Bible and in derivative works. You can't use unsubstantiated claims from the Bible in order to prove that the Bible is true. The New Testament goes on and on about sexual immorality, mentioning it at least 20 times, but the Bible never condemns slavery, rape, child abuse, cruelty to animals, or environmental irresponsibility. Chad quotes Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, referring to Jesus, he will be called a Nazarene. And Chad cites this as one of the prophecies that was fulfilled about Jesus. But where is that prophecy? I've never been able to find it. How is it that simple vulgarity is actually more offensive than the hideous doctrine of eternal torment? Why would a third of the angels in heaven rebel against a being that they know to be omnipotent? All the angels that followed Lucifer, were they just the retarded angels? How is it that saying the word God, followed by a four-letter word of condemnation, a curse that doesn't even include the name of your God, counts as blasphemy? What's wrong with pork? I've heard some people say that at the time it was not very safe to eat, so Yahweh was just protecting people's health. But if that's the case, then why did it become okay to eat pork after Jesus? 
Well, you and I and almost everybody watching this video is warm and fed. There are billions of people in the world who spend their entire lives cold, hungry, and miserable. I'll claim that if you praise a deity for your good fortune, these people would be justified in cursing that same deity. I keep trying to imagine these Disney moments in the book of Joshua where Israeli soldiers march into a town with orders to kill every living thing. I don't know what the mer most merciful way is to kill a little kid. Maybe chop off their head? I'll assume that you agree with me that the vast majority of humans will be condemned. Isn't abortion actually one of the kindest and most merciful gifts one could ever give to an unborn child? Is it impossible for Yahweh to create an intelligent creature that doesn't have to worship it? Miracles such as walking on water, uh, raising the dead, controlling the weather. Why is it that these things are miraculous acts when they're performed by Jesus, but would be considered simply high-tech if performed by someone else? I'm going to give you two options, and you have to choose one of them. The first option is all the homosexuality in the entire world goes away immediately. The other option that you can choose is all the poverty in the world disappears immediately. Also, homosexuality and gay marriage become totally legal, totally accepted immediately. Justice for the victim in the form of healing is a thousand times more important than justice for the criminal in the form of punishment. Why would Yahweh create a bunch of stupid angels that would fight it? If I worship a supreme being called Yahweh, where's the line between you considering me a brother in error and you considering me to be worshiping something false and in grave danger of condemnation? What if my Yahweh has already sent Jesus a second time in the form of Jah Rastafari, as according to the Rastas? What's wrong with people marrying an animal? I mean, yeah, it's bizarre, but who cares? In the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus gives sight to two blind men and then tells them not to let anyone know. So, I was blind, and now I can see, and I'm supposed to pretend that I still can't see. In Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 11, we learn about the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira, who lied about how much money they'd made from a real estate transaction. Why don't we read about the apostles executing child molesters and rapists? What are we to infer about Yahweh's priorities? Con art theism. Let's say you're interviewing for a new job and you talk to the boss for a while. You hear that just recently a full third of the employees working for that guy quit en masse. Everybody only knows the boss's side of the story. Nobody knows why these people actually quit. Do you assume that the boss is a good guy and that all those people who quit are just like crooked or stupid? Or do you kind of wonder about the boss? What are we to infer from the fact that Jesus, whose contemporaries believed that he was a carpenter, was always ready with a parable related to farming or shepherding or estate administration, but never pronounced a single carpentry-related parable? It's pretty obvious at this point that you guys aren't getting any supernatural help. In Matthew 2.16, King Herod issues an order for all Bethlehem area boys two years old and younger to be killed. An angel instructs Joseph to flee with his family. Does Joseph ask the angel for permission to warn the other families in the area? No. Surely Mary? No. The baby Jesus? He did something, right? No. The angel? No. Yahweh? No. Why? Can you sleep at night? Consider the heartwarming story of Jesus rescuing a woman accused of adultery with his profound suggestion that he who is without sin should cast the first stone. My NIV Bible contains a disclaimer. The earliest and most reliable manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not include this story at all. Do you really believe that you and or Ray know more about evolutionary theory than a recent college graduate with a bachelor's in evolutionary biology? Jesus says in various forms that a kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Does this apply to the church, given that there are tens of thousands of denominations of Christianity? Let's say you want to perform an experiment on a new brand of lawn fertilizer. I figure you guys can relate to that. Acts chapter 1 verses 24 to 26, um, the apostles cast lots to determine whether Jesus prefers Matthias or Joseph to replace Judas. Why don't modern Christians do the same? I mean, it's simple, it's easy, it's effective. How do you know that the author of the creation story in Genesis intended it to be a historical account of actual events? 
In John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, Jesus makes his famous I am pronouncement. Let's assume that in this he really was announcing that he is Yahweh itself. Why then, when the Jews pick up stones to execute him for blasphemy, does he run away? Can you clear this up for me? Belief in God isn't some kind of fire insurance. We would be wise to heed its warning of hell. You don't believe in God to avoid going to hell. So if God gives you justice, you're going to go to hell. It has nothing to do with avoiding hell. In John chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus says, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. Isn't that conditional love? I notice that you haven't answered any of my questions. In Luke 14, verse 12, he tells us that when we throw a party, we must not invite friends, brothers, or relatives, but instead the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Very few Christian parties, if any, have ever come close to excluding friends and relatives in favor of these others. Why? How do you convince yourself that the tricks that you play on people are good, while a guy who challenges you to come clean is hiding in the darkness trying not to be exposed? In Luke chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus says, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. He makes many such pronouncements. In Acts, there were no needy persons among them. Why are there so many filthy rich Christians so opposed to socialism? Where, anywhere in the world, is anyone being persecuted expressly for being Christian? Are we to assume that Yahweh hates nerds? Feeding gigantic crowds with only a few scraps of food. What did it look like during these hours of feeding thousands of people no nerdy Jewish kids sat enthralled? Watching Jesus closely? What a ripoff. Roman Catholicism? Why are we persecuting you? Do you really tell yourselves that it's because you're Christians? Because you care about truth and love and living a good life? Really? In Acts 1, we read that Jesus hung out with his pals for over a month after his resurrection. Why is it that after Jesus finally leaves, Peter jumps up and says, By the way, we need to replace Judas. Why did this never come up during the 40 days of Jesus loafing about with them? The total amount of suffering by people who are born and live for any length of time absolutely dwarfs the total amount of suffering by babies who are aborted. The plight of people who live for a while should be opposed far more vigorously than abortion. In Luke 16.9, Jesus says, quote, Use worldly wealth to gain friends. Please explain how this is good and moral behavior. The church seems to hold the all-time world record for disunity, even to the point of bloodshed. Has Yahweh chosen to decline Jesus' prayer? Acts 15 tells us of the hoopla over whether or not Gentiles must be circumcised. Peter, the rock on whom Jesus built his church, rules that Gentiles should not be required to be circumcised. In Galatians 2, 3-5, Paul brags about how he resisted some false brothers and refused to allow Titus to be circumcised. In Galatians 5, 2, if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. In Acts 16.3, Paul circumcises Timothy because of the Jews who lived in that area. What are we to infer about Yahweh's values, given that it allowed Satan to kill Job's ten kids, and then later gave Job some replacement kids? In Acts 12.23, an angel from Yahweh strikes Herod, who is eaten by worms and dies. Why? because he did not give praise to God. But didn't the other Herod order the massacre of every baby boy under two years old in the entire Bethlehem area? Is your God really so vain that it must kill people who fail to praise it, but can allow baby killers to live? Since you're only going to be here a few more weeks, can I have your stuff? In Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, Jesus tells his disciples that he will drink no more wine until the day he drinks it anew with them in his Father's kingdom. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 24, someone offers Jesus wine mixed with gall, and Jesus tastes it. Now, if Jesus is omniscient, then he knew that it had wine in it, and therefore had no need to taste it. I conclude that Jesus broke his earlier promise. Even if you want to say that he tasted rather than drank, given his principle of thought crime, he's busted. With so much at stake, why does Yahweh allow other entities to impersonate it? It's confusing Yahweh math. Infinity times wisdom equals infinite wisdom. Infinity times power equals infinite power. Infinity times mercy equals finite mercy minus the vast majority of you will burn.
the hideous story of Abraham almost killing Isaac, Yahweh must have meant something profound when it said please. What did it mean, and why isn't this discussed extensively among its followers? Some Christians say things like, I wouldn't want to live in a universe where there were no God. But just for a moment, let's take a look at that world. No God, no force of love, nothing but us humans. The world overflowing with unnecessary suffering and injustice. Now compare that universe to what you see around you. The world overflowing with unnecessary suffering and injustice. And almost everyone, including those whose natural lives were full of unbearable suffering, will suffer a fate unimaginably worse than experienced during this life. You'd really rather live in that universe than the one I believe in? Let's take a look at how you guys plan to spend eternity. No sex ever again. Worse than that, no chocolate ice cream. How is an empty eternity better than an empty life that, no matter how bad it is, at least ends at some point? Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I interpret this verse as giving me permission to think all of the horrible things I think about Yahweh Jesus, provided that I admit that it is the dictator of the universe with the power to make up whatever despicable rules it likes. Are you so callous that you can still be happy knowing that billions of people are suffering eternally? It seems that some superstitionists believe that Yahweh will <clears throat> mercifully erase their memory of those loved ones. After such changes have been made to your mind, who is it exactly who is experiencing bliss in heaven? The you that was you here on earth is gone. Jesus refers to children, saying, The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I'll assume that this verse means that children are saved by default. I'll also assume that this can be extended to anyone born with severe mental impairment or who becomes severely impaired while still young. Underlying many types of such impairment is faulty brain chemistry. The people with barely better hormone levels will be held responsible for their choice relative to Jesus, while the others won't. In other words, some people will get into heaven due solely to the difference of a few molecules in their brains. Think about a young child that you know and love. That kid is kidnapped by Muslims, taught the ways of Islam so thoroughly that he or she chooses to be a Muslim. Will that person go to hell? In Luke 22, verse 36, Jesus tells his disciples to buy swords. In verse 38, the disciples point out to Jesus that they already have two swords available, and Jesus tells them two swords are enough. But didn't Jesus already know they had two swords? If two swords are enough, and Jesus knows it, then why did he bother telling them to buy swords? Imagine that while you're asleep, somebody comes and makes an exact copy of you, then takes you somewhere else, and then puts the copy in your bed. Now, you're still going to be you, but... When that copy wakes up, it's going to think it's you. If Jesus is going to give you a new body, then it seems safe to assume that it's going to have a new brain in it. Even if that brain happened to be an exact copy of the brain you have now, it still wouldn't be you. The part of you that experiences pain, um, both physical and emotional, is your brain, the one that's in your head right now. If it's my material brain that experiences pain, then why should I worry about going to hell? When I was 13, I was told that I would burn in hell for all eternity. After several years of absolute terror, I declared with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. The only reason I ever pursued Yahweh Jesus was unimaginable fear. Am I the only person who's ever had this experience? I'll assume not. What will happen to the so-called Christians who don't love Yahweh, but converted just so they wouldn't burn? From Crocobuckism, if you met an adult who believes in Santa Claus, how would you react to him or her? If he were to try to convince you that Santa Claus exists, would you put aside all of your preconceptions and assumptions about Santa and give serious consideration to this person's beliefs? Think of the most godly, humble, devout, sincere people you know. Now I ask each one of these people on a scale of 1 to 10 how confident he or she is that he or she is safe. I'll assume the godliest you could find place themselves the lowest on the scale. My question, is that a loving, kind, merciful God letting its best servants live their entire lives in terror? How many converts do you think you could get if you took all of the hell and fear of suffering out of your message after you tell them that there is some aspect of their sex lives that Jesus really disapproves of? Christians often suggest very strange explanations for the people who reject Christianity. It's because our hearts are hard. I say that it takes an incredibly hard heart to respond to the idea of billions of people suffering eternally with, well, it was their choice.
Why is Yahweh Jesus so lame? In Matthew 6, verses 1-4, to Jesus delivers some rather problematic guidelines for performing acts of charity. In these verses, he isn't even really talking about the needy. Instead, he's talking about the giver and the primary motivation for giving. It's all about some kind of external reward in the form of praise from bystanders. What about the reward of just knowing that you've done something good, helped someone who needed it? And so what if I want the whole world to know about something I've done to help the needy? Are the needy harmed by that in any way? Might it not, in fact, help the needy further by encouraging others who otherwise may not have done anything to give something themselves? Why would Yahweh fake all the DNA of every single life form on earth to make it appear as though everything is descended from a single common ancestor? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, Paul says that Yahweh chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and chose the lowly things of this world. But if that's true, then why did Yahweh choose Paul, a highly educated, well-respected, prominent man with official Roman citizenship, to spread the good news? Why not someone uneducated, maybe Peter the Bumpkin? I believe that there's a pint of delicious chocolate ice cream in my freezer. Now this kind of belief is supported by fact, not the same as believing in Yahweh and Jesus. To believe in Yahweh is to make a choice. Doesn't believe really mean obey? Millions of slaves taken from Africa. They lived and they died pretty miserable existences. And I'm sure many of them, rather than converting to Christianity, and held on to their traditional beliefs. Why would God punish them for holding on to the last vestiges of who they think they really are? Did Joseph and Mary provide the boy Jesus with a perfectly functional family life and upbringing? What were his issues, and what kind of unfair advantage might he have had over us, given that he's God? See if you can answer this one without looking in your Bible. In Acts chapter 8, we read of a sorcerer named Simon. Simon believes and is baptized. The apostles Peter and John soon arrive and begin administering the Holy Spirit. Simon, the new convert, wants to be a part of this, so he offers money to Peter and John. Tell me which of the following two responses is what Peter actually said to Simon, and which response is a fabrication. Here's option one. Simon, Simon, you poor, confused man. God doesn't care about money. He cares about mercy and love. Just seek his ways and let go of materialism, and you'll be fine. And option two. May your money perish with you. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right with God. Repent and pray. Perhaps he will forgive you. Where is heaven exactly? If Jesus ascended in order to get there, then why don't we see it when we fly or when we go up into space? I assume that your answer will have something to do with Jesus moving into the supernatural realm. What are we to infer about the contrivance of ascending into the sky before moving into the supernatural realm? He could have walked through a door that appeared out of nowhere, like in that movie Time Bandits. Why ascend in particular? I count six rather suspicious passages in the Gospel according to Matthew, where a fragment of a story seems to have been corrupted and then duplicated. Chapters 5 and 18, where Jesus says, mutilate your sinful body. Chapters 14 and 15, where Jesus feeds lots of people with very little food. What meaning are we to assign to the fact that God foreordained these 12 events to occur in such a fashion as to appear, when recounted faithfully, to be copying errors? Would you continue to worship your God if it lost its power to punish people, but not any of its other powers? In 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13, Paul goes to great lengths to prove his credentials to the church as a true apostle of Christ. In chapter 12, verse 12, he makes very brief passing mention of signs, wonders, and miracles, which he considers the marks of a true apostle. If Paul were performing these signs, wonders, and miracles, and false apostles were not, then you would think he would make this the foundation of his argument. Instead, it's briefly mentioned in passing in the middle of a large rant on boasting or not boasting about being a true apostle. What books have you guys ever read about evolutionary theory? You summarize the dilemma along these lines. Either God is omnipotent and good, and evil should not exist, or God is not omnipotent and good. All fair enough. You say that because there is a third option, this is a false dichotomy. You present the third option in this form. Mr. Skeptic, 
If God were to destroy all evil, you would cease to exist. Please help me to understand what bearing my existence has on the original dilemma. Satan and his followers actually thought they had a chance at beating Yahweh. Um, not to mention Yahweh and a force of angels that outnumbered them by two to one. Doesn't this prove conclusively that Yahweh is not omnipotent? Science does get it wrong sometimes, but does that mean it can't be trusted? In the same manner, if we can't trust science, how can we trust any of the human interpretations of the Bible? If someone were to tell me a lie, and because of that lie I chose to accept Jesus, would my salvation count? I mean, would I actually be saved? How do you distinguish between good and evil? 